Welcome, everyone. Uh, so glad you're here tonight. Uh, so excited for some new faces here at the Westmont Women and even some other new people here tonight. So it's really glad to see you, everyone. Uh, my name is Pastor Lars, and um, uh, Pastor Nate is on his way back from Mexico. I think he's probably on the 405 right now trying to get back in crazy ta traffic, but I have the opportunity to bring you the word tonight. I did want to share, um, upcoming weeks, we are trying to come back to Sunday mornings. We're still targeting August 22nd as hopefully 9 a.m. here in the tent. If we can do that, right now we're trying to work out a shared agreement for Sunday mornings with the Christ Lutheran Church that we rent the property from. So you can be praying alongside us for that. Things are going well, but we, uh, we would love to, love to have your prayers, and we'll probably decide that within the next week. We'll have some more information, so stay, t stay tuned. Also, I wanted to say that I have my mom here tonight from Ohio, yeah, where I grew up. Yeah, so thankful for my mom, always been praying for me, and that's part of the reason that I'm here right now, actually. And um, please open your Bible to Acts chapter 10, and we're going to look at another great narrative in the book of Acts. Have you guys been enjoying it? Our viral church series, it's been so wonderful just to see how the Spirit is moving through the book of Acts in order to form the early church. It's been such a great time in the Word doing that. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard the word air. I'm sure you have. It can refer to a lot of different things. But the way I like to use it is the beginning of an era or an end of an era. It's like the beginning of an era is something when something truly exciting is happening. Something's kind of going on that makes it sort of special. Now, I have to say, I'm not a Golden State Warriors fan, but actually, I'm, I'm from Ohio. I was a Cleveland Cavaliers fan who actually did, you know, defeat the Golden State Warriors in uh, NBA Finals. I'd like to point that out. But in the, uh, just about five or six years ago, the Golden State Warriors were unstoppable. And that was quite an era, right, with Steph Curry, Draymond Green, eventually Kevin Durant, Clay Thompson, and they were able to actually revolutionize basketball in just a special way in which they were able to win back-to-back -back NBA titles, among other things. It was just amazing. It was like, a, it was like an era, but now that era has come to, come to an end. I'm sorry, Golden State Warrior fans. Or you might even think of there's just the era of when you're single and a young adult, right? You're going to college, you're staying up all night studying, right? And, um, you know, it's just the era. It's just something that happens in your life. It's like something that just is special. There's a lot of things going on, and that comes to an end. And then maybe you get married, and that's a beautiful era as well. Every night's a date night. It's beautiful. And then there's another era called kids, right? Because when you have kids, there are no more date nights, right? It's just taking care of your kids, and that's also just a very sweet era. Or anything. So what we're looking at tonight is really the era of the new church. And we're going to be talking about the beginning of a new era. And this is the era in which people other than Jewish people are coming into the church. It's a very unique time. And this story about Cornelius that we're going to look at tonight is really about that. So what we're going to see is all the people that were not Jewish, how do they come into the church? So for a long time, it was really just the Jews that were getting saved and being brought in the church. How does anybody that's not a Jew get in the church? We're going to look at that tonight. Now, I'm going to assume that a lot of people here tonight are not of Jewish lineage. If you're not of Jewish lineage, please raise your hand. Right. Okay. This is, this is pretty much a Gentile church. If you're Jewish here tonight, this is, a, you know, this is pretty much it. But I know we do have some Jewish people. Is there anybody with Jewish lineage here tonight? There we go. Raise your hand. So the combination of the Jews and the Gentiles is even here tonight. It's such a beautiful thing. So last week we saw how God took one of his enemies and made him his friends. And yes, I'm talking about Saul of Tarsus. He became Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, in a dramatic conversion on the road to Damascus. Paul became a preacher of the gospel that he received straight from Jesus. And this was the beginning of the word spoken over him by Ananias the prophet that we looked at last week, that Paul would be a chosen vessel to bear Jesus' name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Now that the persecution against Christians was really stopped by Paul's conversion in part, the, per the church actually experiences a time of growth and renewal. And what the book of Acts does is it leaves Paul preaching, and then it turns back to Peter, who is really on fire for the Lord. And what he does in chapter 9 is just amazing. He brings a healing in this place called Lydda to a man named Aeneas who's been bedridden for eight years. And that actually turns the whole community to Christ by that man's healing. Then he is called to Joppa where a young woman named Tabitha, or in the Greek her name's Dorcas, has just suddenly died. Paul brings her back to life. 
in just the manner that we saw Jesus do within the Gospels. And then he, goes, he sets up shop in Joppa where that healing happens, and he stays with a guy named Simon the Tanner for many days. And that really provides our entrance into Acts chapter 10 that we're going to look at tonight. Now, this story is an incredibly important story because it shows how the Gentiles come to know Jesus. Gentiles, as I said before, it's just another word for you and I, anybody that doesn't have Jewish lineage. Now, from the Old Testament, if you read through it, we knew that God always wanted the Gentiles to be part of the kingdom of God. He said that in many different places. But we don't see that happening in the ministry of Jesus. Really, in Jesus' ministry, he was just sent to the lost sheep of Israel. He did make some comments about Gentiles coming in, but really his ministry was straight to the Jews. So up until now, very few Jew Gentiles have been saved in the book of Acts. And now God wants to usher in a new era of saving Gentiles and baptizing them in the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see that tonight, and that includes us. So this story of Cornelius is really a divine appointment orchestrated by God to bring people into the kingdom. And I'll tell you, if you're sitting here tonight, the same outpouring of the spirit that was on Cornelius is available for you tonight. Because we're those non-Jewish people that can look at this story and say, I know that Jesus loves me because how he brought Cornelius into the kingdom. Can you say with me tonight, Jesus loves me? Jesus, let me hear it. Okay, let's say it a little bit louder. I think you guys can do a little bit better than that. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. And you can tell us by the story from Cornelius. So God has an absolutely amazing plan for the Gentiles. And the first thing he does, is he does it through this guy, Cornelius. Let's start in verse 1 through 8. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what is called the Italian Regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And so he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. Lord Jesus, we just uh, thank you so much tonight for this wonderful story of Cornelius, Lord. His story is our story of how we're being brought into the kingdom of God by divine appointments that you orchestrate to bring us near to you. We just pray that you give us grace to hear your word and to listen to it tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So this area, Caesarea, is a region heavily populated by Rome. And the man's name is Cornelius. He's a leader over 100 soldiers. That's what centurion means. He's described here as a devout man. This is a man that fears the Lord, which means he has reverence for God. He has great leadership. He's brought his whole family and his household to know Jesus or to know God. He gave alms, which means he gave money for the poor and those that had need. And the Bible says that he prayed to God always. He's a great guy, but he's a Gentile, which means that even though he loved the God of Israel, he could never eat or associate with any Jewish person, which is kind of an interesting thing. It's a strange thing. So about the ninth hour, at about 3 p.m., he has this amazing vision of God, of an, God, of an angel of God. So first of all, the angel calls him by his name. Cornelius turns his head and immediately knows that God is sending him a divine message through this angel. The angel first mentions his devotion to his, in his prayers and the giving as being a memorial to God. And this is a way of saying that God recognizes Cornelius as an open seeker of God, someone that's responsive to God. But God has more for him, and we'll see that in just a moment. So then the angel gives him really this divine directive. He says, send men. And that's important to note because Cornelius is not going to go on this trip himself. The reason is, is that what's going to happen is actually going to happen back in Caesarea. So the angel actually tells him, send guys to Caesarea and bring Peter back. This is one way that God is orchestrating this encounter so that it's going to happen in Caesarea. He then gives him Peter's location with, his, this, with Simon the Tanner by the sea. And he, then he says something interesting. He says, he will tell you what you must do. 
Now, it's really cool because the angel could have told him what Peter was going to tell him. The angel revealed everything else to him. But this is kind of like a spiritual scavenger hunt, right? Something you might play in youth group like on a Wednesday night. Where he's like, okay, you're going to get your next clue when you show up in Joppa and Peter's going to tell you what to do. So, again, this is really interesting how this is being orchestrated. And Cornelius is down with it. He's basically going to do exactly what he's being asked to do. So the angel told him about Jesus, but uh, could have told him about Jesus, but he doesn't. He's going to do it a different way. So, they go, so what God is doing here is setting up Cornelius for a divine appointment. Cornelius has no idea what is about to happen to him, but he just obeys anyway. The point is, is that he's spiritually open and available to God's calling in his life. He's just in prayer, helping the poor. My question to you is, are you ready for a divine appointment like what happened to Cornelius? The question is not whether God has divine appointments for you. The question is, are you faithful and willing to walk in what God has for you? Because God is good all the time. He is always going to be setting up divine appointments for you. I don't know if you expect these things, but I know I do. When I go out, I'm like, okay, I think God may use me in whatever different way in a person's life that's right next to me. It might be sharing the gospel. It might be encouraging somebody. It might be helping your neighbor or helping a roommate or whatever. But I know that because God is good, he's always going to be setting up divine appointments just like he's setting up Cornelius for a divine appointment right here. Amen? Amen. So if you believe that God is good, you have to be aware that he's going to set up these things all the time for you if you're just ready and available for his working and his power to work through you. It's an amazing thing. Since you guys ask, I'm just going to tell you one that just happened to me. This happened actually some years ago. And I was back in Ohio, I was visiting my parents there, but I also ran into my friend, his name was Nathan, uh, was Nathan Zumberg. And uh, what happened to him was that I had given him at one point in his life, I wasn't even walking with the Lord at this point, but I'd given him an autobiography of Bob Dylan. If you know anything about Bob Dylan, I, you know, he was, he was kind of in the 60s and sang a bunch of different songs. But what happened to him is that he got saved, and he actually released a lot of gospel albums, and he wrote an autobiography which kind of told about his experience coming to Jesus. Well, Nathan actually wrote that book, read that book, and that's exactly how he came to know Jesus. The problem is, is that he had already moved away from the town that we grew up in together, and nobody really knew that he was a Christian except for me. Well, we met back in the little town that I grew up in. It was called Salina, Ohio. And one thing that he really liked to do is he liked to sing karaoke. So we go to this place where they're, where they're singing karaoke, and he wants to get up, and he wants to sing Bob Dylan's Like a Rolling Stone. So I'm just sitting. I'm not singing, by the way, okay? I'm not singing. I'm not, this doesn't include me singing. So I'm just sitting there watching him sing the song, and at the, after the last verse of Like a Rolling Stone, he falls backwards and he dies on the spot. It still almost brings me to tears just to tell you this story. He, di he, died, he just died right there. It turns out he had a heart problem when he was a child, and basically he had experienced blackouts, and then, it, you know, it, just, it, it was a massive heart attack, and he died right there. I was sitting there. Obviously, the paramedics were called. We, you know, he was brought to the hospital. He was pronounced dead. I was with his parents there who I barely knew. And one of the things that they asked me to do, since I was in town at the time, is they asked me to share his eulogy in the, in the church. And it was in a Catholic church. And I said, sure, I'd, I'd be glad to do that. And so there I was. I found myself in the church sharing his eulogy, sharing how he came to know Jesus, which nobody else and none of his friends really knew about his conversion to Christ. Let me just tell you, that's, an, that's a divine appointment, right? Could that have been orchestrated any other way? I probably wouldn't even have flown back to, you know, for his funeral if I, if I had known about it. There'd been no way that I could have done that. But God had set up that opportunity for me. Just because of what I'm telling you, he's good, and he's always going to be setting up for these. I, I've got a ton more. You can ask me after the service if you, if, you, if, you, if you want to hear more of those same things. But that's one of the most dramatic ones that, it, that I've experienced in my life, how just God used me, and I had no idea that he was going to use me just in that way. So are you ready for those divine encounters that God has for you? I guarantee because he's good, he has them for you. So Cornelius is sending this delegation to a man that he's never met before. And these guys are about ready to get to the city of Joppa where Peter's staying. Now at the same time, again, this is like split second Jesus timing right here. God's about ready to speak to Peter. Look at verse 9. 
Again, I should have mentioned we have the YouVersion Bible app, so our, our study is there today. You can look at that if you'd like to. All our study notes and those things are available there. But in verse 9, it says this. The next day as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven's o- heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. So as these guys are nearing the city, Peter goes up to the house to pray. It's the time is about six hour, about, it's a sixth hour, which is noon. This isn't a traditional hour of Jewish prayer. So we really know that the Spirit is really directing Peter to go up to the top of the house at this moment. But since it's noon, Peter's getting really hungry. And so he falls into the trance. And the vision comes with the heavens open and this great sheet being lowered down with all kinds of animals, creeping things, birds of the air. And the voice of God comes to him and says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, this is really interesting because in the Old Testament, there's these food regulations that Jewish people were not supposed to be eating these animals that were in the sheet. Examples would be, of course, pork, a pig, any kind of shellfish, kinds of birds of prey, all kinds of different things like that. And these were really given to keep the people of Israel separate from all the pagan nations around them and completely devoted to God. And so these restrictions defined what it meant to be Jewish and different from everyone else around them. So a Jew could never eat with a Gentile because they they would never eat the things that a Jew would eat. Or a Jew would never eat with a Gentile because they ate things that a good Jew would never eat. They could never sit at a table and eat and share fellowship together, which was kind of the point to keep people separate for himself as was God's intention here. So when Peter hears this from the Lord, his first response is, not so, Lord, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And this is to say Peter's neither eaten anything that he's not supposed to, but also he's never sat down with a non-Jewish person to eat with anybody that's not a Jew. So the voice of the Lord speaks to him again and says, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. Vision happens three times and the object taken up into heaven. Now, Peter obviously is disturbed, and he's like, I don't know what this means. You can see he's completely disoriented right here, and it continues in verse 17. We'll see the account. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited them and lodged them. On the next day, Peter went away with them, and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. So while Peter's wondering what this vision can mean, the guys sent by Cornelius are standing at the gate right then. Again, another divine appointment. They ask Peter at the front gate. At the same time, the Holy Spirit speaks to Peter, who tells him there's three guys that are at the gate, and you need to go with them and don't fear anything. Peter goes downstairs, talks to the guys. Here's the vision that God gave to Cornelius, and he agrees to go with them. Now, let me ask you a question. Place yourself in this story. Would you go if this happened to you? What do you think? All right? I remember God asked Peter to do something that's completely against what he thought he should be doing, right? And he asked him to go with guys that he doesn't even know to a place that he's never been to meet to another guy that he doesn't know. Would you do this? If you were sitting there in, in, in Peter's spot, would you go? Like, I, I hope so. Okay, so he's being invited again to the home of a Gentile where he's never even ever eaten a meal with a Gentile person. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in this situation before, but I have, where you've gone to somebody's home and you're like, 
I don't know if I really want to eat what's being put before me here. Have you been there with me? Again, you might not want to admit that, but I've been there. One time, um, my friend and I, Connor, we were in Southeast Asia, and we were with some people. Uh, a missionary picked us up with all the orphanage children, and I don't even know what it was. The bones were really small. I was like, I think I'm eating cat right now. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I'm eating right now, but again, it was more about the fellowship than it was about the food, so here we are eating cat. It, 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 I, I still don't know what it was, but it was, it was interesting, all right? So the vision that Peter has, he's not about, it's not about food. It wasn't about food, but it was really about fellowship that he was supposed to have with someone that wasn't Jewish. But it may be hard for us to understand, but God had kept the Jewish people separate from the Gentiles so long to preserve his people. But now they're brought together as one body in the church. And this is exactly what God is doing here. Now, Paul wrote about this later in the book of Ephesians. I just want to share the scripture with you because I think it shares some light on this situation so you can see how important of issue it was for the people of that time. In, in Ephesians 2, verse 14, it says, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Isn't that a great scripture? It, de it describes exactly what's going on in the situation. So this is the beginning of the Jews and the Gentiles coming together into one body. Jesus broke down the wall of hostility between the Jews and Gentiles that separated them. This is a complete new era in which the food regulations no longer applied because Jesus was forming a whole new people together in his body in Christ Jesus by his grace of dying upon the cross for our sins. This is something, again, that was promised all the way through the Old Testament, and now it's happening right here. It's a great day in the New Testament for the book of Acts. So now let's see what happens next in the verse 24 as we read the account. And the following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. As he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation, but God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked then, for what reason have you sent me? So Peter and the entourage come to Caesarea where Cornelius is waiting with all his family and his friends. He's gathered everybody there. He's so excited when he sees Peter, he falls down. Peter, he falls down at his feet and worships him. Peter, of course, accepts no worship. He says, stand up. I myself am a man. Then he proceeds to share what God had spoken to him in the vision. It's like, I, 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 Peter's like, now I see that God has called no man common or unclean. We can get together. We can be one body. This is the meaning of the vision God has shown to Peter, and he's, showing, he's displaying that right here. Peter then says, why have you sent me? Again, this is the spiritual scavenger hunt that he's on. Well, then uh, Cornelius explains his side of the story just as that happened to him. And then he says in verse 33, So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now, for, now, therefore, we are all present before God to hear the things commanded you by God. So they're ready and waiting. They've gathered here for this moment. moment and what is Peter going to say? He is on the spot right here. But God has supernaturally prepared him for this moment, and he knows exactly what to say. Of course, he's going to preach the gospel, and we'll read that in verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation who fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. The word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with them. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. 
Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witnessed that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. This is a great sermon by a guy that's just being put on the spot, right? First thing that Peter says is God shows no partiality. He does not favor one person over another based on nationality, color of skin, or any other characteristic. Instead, God's gold standard of fellowship is those who fear him and do good. Then we see Peter preach the gospel. It's so cool how he does it. Look at verse 36. He says, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. Part of this new era brought by the no matter what tribe, tongue, or nation we are from, through Jesus, we can be brought together as one because Jesus is Lord of all. Did you get that? I'm going to say that again. It's the most important thing. Part of this new era brought by the gospel is that no matter what tribe, tongue, and nation we are from, through Jesus, we can be brought together as one because Jesus is Lord of all. And for the Gentiles, this is so cool. It's so cool for you even sitting here right now. If you're a Gentile sitting here right now, it's the reason that you're part of the kingdom of God. It's because of this story that's right here within the word of God. Now, have you ever looked around the body? Have you ever looked around this church? Just look around and see the different people here. We have every tribe, tongue, and nation in this body, right? People that you would never know, right, except that you went to church with them are right here in this tent. It's a beautiful thing how God has, has brought together different races, different ethnicities, different nationalities. In fact, Anthem Chapel is representative of what God wanted when he brought the Gentiles and the Jewish people together to form one new church. I hope you appreciate that. The people you see here, you, you, the only reason that you really know them is because you go to church with them. Because that's the way God designed his church with and Jesus, as Lord of all, bringing all the people together. It's an amazing thing. So Peter goes on to preach Jesus and mentions three things. Each of these things are super important when we talk about Jesus or have an opportunity about, to talk about him. Uh, one is we need to mention the anointed life of Christ. God did this by anointing Jesus with the power of the Holy Spirit and with power to heal and deliver people from the oppression of the devil. I need to mention the perfect anointed life of Jesus when we talk about him. Second, it's the atonement of Jesus. It may seem like a big word, but atonement just means a right thing done to repair a wrong thing. Again, a right thing done to repair a wrong thing. Uh, Jesus did a right thing by hanging on a tree to repair all the wrong things that we have done. He atoned for us. He did the right thing for all the wrong things that we have done. And then third, we need to mention the afterlife of Jesus. Jesus was risen from the dead, shown to witnesses, including Peter, who ate and drank with him after he rose again from the dead. So again, Jesus is anointed life, the atonement of Jesus, and the afterlife of Jesus. Because of these things, he's become the judge of the living and the dead. He's been given authority over everyone that's alive and everyone that's dead. And the only way that to receive him is to really believe in him because, as Jesus said, I'm the only way. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And this, this passage demonstrates that. I can say it this way. He is the only way because he is the only one that lived that anointed life, that atoned for your sins, and that rose again from the dead. That's why. Okay. Now, if you're asking how to have assurance you'll get into heaven when you die, it's just by giving Jesus your life. It's just by believing that he died for your sin and trusting that as just as he was resurrected to life, you'll be resurrected to life, eternal life, one day. Now, the incredible thing about that message is that it is the most powerful message upon the earth. Preaching the perfect life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ is the most powerful message that you can ever tell somebody. Because by preaching it, a life can be changed in just a moment, right? People can be changed from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of life, right? People can get born again by the Spirit of God, and their spiritual state is converted in just a moment. 
There's no other message other than the message of Jesus Christ that can do that in a person's life. And I hope tonight, if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is a night to be ready for it. Because the message of the gospel is being clearly preached. And all we need to do is, order, is, is to respond to it. And your spiritual state could be converted just in a moment, right? The sinful life that you lived, all the things that you've done wrong, those can be wiped away in just a moment. And you can have new life in Christ because of preaching the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. Amen? Isn't that so cool? Now, the proof of that is what happens in verse 44. If you don't believe me, look at verse 44. While Peter was still preaching, was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, that's the Jewish people, who believed were astonished. And as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. So let me make the point. Peter wasn't even done preaching before people got saved, right? It's like the Holy Spirit was like, I'm not even waiting for Peter to get done with his message. I'm going to save people right now, right? That just tells you so much how God loves you so much, right? It wasn't even about Peter at all. It was like God just wanted to save some people, and as soon as they heard about Jesus and his life, his death, his resurrection, people started getting saved right there. Right? That tells you something about the power of the gospel message and how much Jesus desires to bring people into his kingdom. It's an incredible message. It's something that should stimulate your soul. I hope it's a message that you never get tired of. So the very spirit of Jesus Christ completely impacted these people in a radical way to bring salvation to them. And everyone, all the Jewish people are just standing around just being like, they're just completely astonished at what the Holy Spirit has done in Cornelius and his whole household's life. These guys are speaking in tongues. They're glorifying. They're magnifying God. They're instantly and radically touched by the Holy Spirit. And Peter is totally pumped. He's stoked out of his mind. He says, can anyone forbid water? Let's get these guys baptized. Now, what Peter is saying here, he says, let's baptize these people because the Holy Spirit has fallen upon them just like he did us. Now, what that means is Peter's referring back to Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 4, where it talks about Peter and, and, those, and the disciples and the tongues of fire coming upon them and the Spirit giving them utterance so that they would be able to speak in tongues and glorify and magnify God as well. The same Pentecost that had happened for the Jewish people was now happening for the Gentile people right here. It's the same thing. Peter knows it. He's like, let's be these guys baptized too. It's amazing. And instantly where there was separation between the Jewish people and the Gentile people, now they were one body together, just as we, we see demonstrated in the church this Sunday evening. It's a beautiful, it's a wonderful thing. Now, looking back on this divine appointment between Cornelius and Peter, I think there's really three things that really prepare us for uh, a divine appointment. First, you got to be prayed up, right? The common thread between Peter and Cornelius is they're both praying, right? Peter's praying on the housetop at noon. He's getting hungry. And you got Cornelius. He's praying as well. And that's where the Lord really speaks to people or speaks to both of these guys. It's what really prepared them for the divine appointment that God had for them. And I just wonder if we're prayed up more, right, if we have that time of prayer in the morning or whatever time your prayer time is in the evening, that if we're prayed up, you'll be more available and God would reveal more of his divine opportunities to you in a special way. You have to be prayed up. Second, I think this is one of the more important things, is we have to know it's going to be crazy, all right? And Peter had to have a crazy vision he didn't even understand to go with guys that he didn't even know to a place that he's never been with no idea of what he was going to do. Again, if you place yourself in the story, you might think of like, I think I would have done it. I would have done like Peter did. I would have, I would have gone, but I'm not so sure if I would have, right? Again, I think we just have to be willing to get a little crazy for the gospel, right? To be able to, for God to use us in places that are outside of our comfort zone, I think we need that. 
And God is going to blow our minds with how he works. It's not going to be according to logic. It's not going to be something that you really just thought that you would ever do. But God's going to do something special in your life. But he's going to have to do it. And it's going to be a little bit crazy. You're going to have to step out of the boat. You're going to have to have some faith and just be like, God, I'm just going to step into whatever you're going to have for me here. And God knows when your heart's willing to do that. I think being prayed up really prepares you to go a little crazy for Jesus. The third thing I think you need to know going into it is that the fruit will be amazing, right? God will amaze you when you accept the calling that he has upon your life. Look at the fruit that God produced out of this, right? Cornelius and his whole household get saved and baptized because Peter was willing to take a crazy chance on going with some guys to Caesarea, all right? You have to know that God is going to produce amazing fruit. Even when it doesn't even look like it's going to be amazing fruit, you just got to be ready to go for it and know that if God is directing it, he's going to do something amazing in your life. It might not be as dramatic as this account, but these type of divine encounters are what give you joy and purpose in your Christian life, right? It's the type of things that when you go to bed at night that make you smile and be like, God, use me today. This was awesome, you know. Look at the divine appointment that God gave me today. I walked in that. And I think there's this spiritual juice that you get from doing what God called you to do, right? Doesn't that? I mean, when I think about through my days, it's just the, the moment of encouragement that I was able to give to somebody. The gospel I shared with somebody. The help that I was able to supply to somebody. I'm like, yes, my life has purpose. God is using me and, and for his glory in different people's lives. Again, going back for the, to the fact that we, since we know God is good, he's going to set up divine appointments for us all the time, right? All the time. Now, I've got a couple applications for you as the worship team comes up. Some of you guys, your divine calling is to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior tonight, right? That's the reason that you're here. God has prepared you, and he's made you ready for this. He loves you so much that he lived a perfect life, that he died for your sins, and he rose again from the dead. That's it. The power to change your life completely is here tonight. You've heard the gospel preached. Just like Jesus was so ready to save Cornelius and his whole household, he's ready to save you right now. And this could be a completely new era for you, where you can leave the past behind and you can kind of walk into the future that Jesus has for you. It's an amazing moment. And God has brought you here tonight to hear that. Are you ready for that calling? Some of you guys might think, everybody around me, my friends think I'm a Christian, but I know I'm not. This might be your moment tonight. Some of you have just been wobbling on the fence and say, hey, maybe I made a commitment at one time in my, in my life, but I don't even sure if I really made that commitment. I don't even know where I'm at with Jesus. I don't even know if I died tonight, what would happen to me. I don't even know if I go to heaven. You have no assurance. I'm telling you right now, the gospel has been preached to you tonight in a way that you can receive it. And if you raise your hand in just a moment to receive Christ, God will do something powerful within your life. Your life will be transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Your sins will be forgiven, and you'll have new life in Christ. And it will be different for you. Are you ready for that? Now, others of you, you have a divine calling in your life to do something for Jesus that's going to take a lot of faith to walk in. And maybe you even know what that divine calling is. Maybe God has already presented it to you. And maybe he's already, he's just laying it on you tonight, saying, hey, I know, I want you to go to this person. I want you to share Jesus with them. I want you to help them. I want you to be a neighbor to them. I want you to encourage them with the word. Maybe even God is dropping a word or a name into your heart and into your mind, even tonight, that you know God wants you to do. Somebody that's sick, that needs a phone call. Somebody that God is going to use you powerfully in their lives. And just like Peter God is preparing you to receive the calling that he has for you. If it's in this moment, as you're praying, don't resist the power of the Holy Spirit. Just ask God what that is and then walk in it. Think about this. God has given you a divine appointment to come here tonight and to use you powerfully. The only question is, will you walk in what he has for you? Let's close in prayer. Jesus, we just thank you that you work you work in such dramatic ways, Lord. This story has just got me appalled with just how good you are. How you will just set the stage and put the pieces and orchestrate them all together for your glory. It just it makes me weep for joy just thinking about how, how good you are. How much you love us just so completely. 
And when we look back on our lives, Lord, we just see how you've just crazy loved us up to this point. Whether we've just been invited here tonight as a, as a friend or whether we've been coming here for a long time, we can just look back and say, God, you brought me here. You're the reason that I'm here tonight. And then, Lord, I know that you'll use this divine appointment even now. We're thankful for that. Lord, I just pray for those that have not put their faith in you tonight. They have no assurance of what's going to happen to them when they pass from this earth. And just whether they, you know, they're maybe embarrassed. They, they think everybody thinks I'm a Christian, but I know I'm not. And yet, God, I just pray, Lord, that your saving power would just be upon your Holy Spirit, would just be breathed out upon them in Jesus' name. And uh, if you're in that place tonight, if you know that you need the gospel, if you know that you need Jesus to save you, would you just slip your, well, every head is bowed, every eyes is closed, and we're praying. Would you just slip your hand if you're a person that knows that you need Jesus Christ tonight? You need salvation tonight. There's one right there. Anybody else? You don't know what's going to happen to you when you die. You don't have the assurance of salvation. Would you please raise your hand tonight when, if you know that you need Jesus? Okay. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Jesus, I believe in you. You can repeat after me. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you died. I believe that you rose again. I receive your forgiveness for my sin. I want new life in you. Jesus, I give you my life. Please take it in Jesus' name. And Lord, I know there's others. Lord, I just know that there's others, Lord, that they have just received a divine a calling upon their life, Lord, just a word from you. Lord, I know that they need prayer tonight for the faith to walk in that decision, Lord, to pursue the person you've called them to or to do the work that you've called them to do. If you have a sense that the Lord has a divine calling upon your life or he's speaking to you tonight, would you raise your hand? I want to pray for you to have the faith to walk in what God has called you to. Amen. Amen. Just raise your hands. I want to pray for you that the power of the Holy Spirit would come upon you. And Jesus, I pray for all these in faith, Lord, that, that they've just received a divine calling from you, God. Uh, Lord, I don't know what it is, Lord, but I pray, Lord, that the power of the Holy Spirit that was so present to save Cornelius and his whole household would be so present in their divine encounter, God. And they would walk in faith, Lord, knowing that you strengthen their inner man, their inner woman, Lord, to pursue you with all their might, Lord, and to do what you called them to do. And they would be able to see the fruit is amazing. It might be a little bit crazy, but the fruit would be amazing. <laughs> Jesus, would you do it in your precious name? Oh, and Lord, I know that you uh, you know, you rejoice. The angels in heaven are rejoicing right now for those who have made a commitment to Jesus Christ tonight. Oh, Lord, we just uh, shout your name and praise, Lord. We just rejoice with those, Lord, that are rejoicing right now. Why don't you just lift up a shout of praise to God? So thankful, Jesus, for all that you've done. We worship you. Thank you so much, Jesus. All right, would you stand to your feet as we worship the Lord for this final song? We're going to have a prayer team right over here by the picnic tables, right where it says receive prayer right here. If you need prayer for that divine calling that God has, has upon your life, if you received Christ tonight, we want to put a Bible in your hand. Would you go over there and pray with us? We know that God's on the move here, and if God is touching your heart to come forward in prayer, these people are awesome. They're wonderful. They're safe to pray with. So please come forward. Please pray. God has a divine moment for you. I, I guarantee because he's good, he wants to set good things up within your life. Thank you, Jesus. We pray a blessing on tonight. Let us worship you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's worship the Lord.